guy? And what is he like? What is he not like? And this is super important to really dive in and ask the question of who is this God that we're coming to, to understand? Um, but before we jump into that, I want to ask us a question. Um, how many of you have ever fallen in like before? <laughs> totally. I've fallen hard in like. In like. Like when you're really in like with someone. You guys know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you have a crush on someone. Come on, guys. <laughs> uh, when you just like fall totally in like, right? Um, so it happens to all of us. And sometimes we are lucky enough for that other person to like us back. And there's a magical time. Um, I remember when Sarah and I were falling in like with each other, <laughs> and it was just amazing, and all these, you know, you're so excited to see the person, and it's a good time. Uh, and there's, there's misunderstandings during this time, and it's confusing during this time, but it's really exciting. But I know for me, one of the things that I can fall into during this period is that I can start making assumptions about the person I am falling in like with. And I, I really caution people when they're starting to like someone to be careful because this is what we do. And I wonder if you guys do this. And this is what I did. I meet this amazing girl and she loves Jesus and she's really cute. And then I just fill in the rest. And I'm like, she must be the woman of my dreams. And the woman of my dreams is like blank, 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 blank. Like all of these things, and I just start assuming things. And guys, let me tell you, this is not a good way to do it. It's not honoring to the girl to just be like, oh, yeah, I already know you. But like, you must be like this, right? And you must be like this. And you can get in trouble this way. And I remember that's what happened to me. Um, a couple times I thought Sarah liked joking a little more than she did. Or I just kind of assumed she was like an extrovert like me, and so I, I want to hang out with people all the time. And that kind of got me in trouble. Um, so what we, what we can do is we fall in love with our perception of this person and our assumptions of this person. And then sometimes we actually get to know them and they're different than what we thought they were like. And then we are like upset at them sometimes and we're a little mad at them and we're just frustrated because they're not meeting all of our expectations. Um, that didn't happen with Sarah. Sarah is perfect. She exceeded all my expectations. And, um, but we have to be careful. Jumping to assumptions is not good. And what can happen is we do this with God. Uh, we can assume things about God. And this, so don't make assumptions about God. Uh, and this is, this is not good either way. And I'll show you guys how. Sometimes people hear about God and they jump to all these conclusions about who he is. And God is amazing and he, he loves me so much and he would never let anything bad happen to me because he loves me. And I actually had someone tell me, um, like as they, when they just bought a Bible, that after they bought the Bible, they also ran into a girl and it seemed like things were going to work out for them. And it was like, somehow the Bible was like a good luck charm. And that was giving them good luck. And sometimes we can do that. Oh, because God loves me, he's given me this relationship. Even if the relationship is unhealthy. And we just kind of assume these things about God. God wants me to have this because he loves me. Rather than actually looking at his word and seeing what he has for us. And so we can get in trouble that way. But we can also get in trouble the other way. We can hear things about God. We can hear rumors about God. What he's like. God's a racist. He's into genocide. And then we can just kind of shut ourselves off. And we can be like, well, I'm not into that. Um, I'm not into bashing anyone or their preferences. So um, this whole me and God thing can't work out. And what we do is we make assumptions rather than coming to God and saying, who are you? What are you like? And so I think that's why this series is going to be really good because we're going to be walking through the different attributes of God <coughs> from how he's revealed himself. Rather, not just what we want to believe about him, but how he's revealed himself to us and what we can know about him. Uh, and then we can make, okay, is this a God I want to follow? Um, so tonight we are going to jump in, and I'm going to kick us off. We are going to be looking at how big we are going to be looking at how great God is. 
And I know personally, this is something that I think I kind of forget a lot. Um, if I'm honest, sometimes I just believe that God is a slightly bigger, slightly smarter version of me. Right? Because like, he created me, and so I'm kind of similar to him, but this is really dangerous. And I'll show you why. When I, when I shrink God, and I forget how big God is, I'm really, it's really easy for me to get upset at him. I see something happening in life, and I, and I start praying for it, and I know this is the best way. Maybe I'm praying for a friend. Maybe it's a situation going down. And I'm like, this is the best way. Anything else would be bad. Come on, God, come through. And God doesn't come through. And I can start getting bitter at God. Because I know what is best. And I know what is good. And if God didn't do that, maybe he's not powerful enough to do it. And that's why he didn't actually do it. And I forget that maybe it's because he's so much bigger than me and his plan is so much greater than I can even understand. And it's funny how arrogant I can be sometimes, thinking that I know better than God. And I can put God on trial and try to judge God. God, this isn't fair. God, this isn't just. My whole sense of justice only comes because God is just. And so for me to say he's not just, but that's what happens when I shrink God. When bad things happen, I can, I can say, well, is God even real? Because these bad things happened. And in my understanding, these bad things wouldn't happen if a good God was up there. Not understanding that he is so much bigger than me. The Bible at the very beginning makes it clear we are made in God's image. But what we do is we return the favor. And we make God in our own image. And we say, thanks, God. Now I'm going to make you in my image. And what we do is we shrink God down to a size that we can handle. And we make God our own personal little God, which is actually no God at all. We, so much of the time, I find myself believing in a small God. And I just wanted to tonight focus on this idea just to blow it up that God is so much bigger. So we're going to look at we're going to look at a verse from Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. And it says, and this is God speaking, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Everything we can imagine about God is too small. Everything that we can think about God is too small. Your love for God, like God's love for you, is too small. You've imagined it too small. We can't understand it. God is so much bigger. He's so much greater. And if we could understand it, he wouldn't be God. It's like if you went and tried to lean down and explain the internet to an ant. And that's not even fair, because the difference between us and the ants is actually a lot closer than us and God. Mm. And it just sounds ridiculous to try to explain to an ant, there's just some things that they're not going to get, right? And when we understand that, we need to humble ourselves and realize we are that much smaller than God. In the Bible, when angels show up on the scene, if you've read it, there's a bunch of different stories about when angels show up, People, like, start tripping out. And they're, like, terrified. They're freaked out. And these angels always have to remind them, like, hey, calm down. Like, I'm not going to kill you. It's okay. Um, and they also have to remind people, like, hey, stop worshiping me. I'm not God. I know I look pretty cool. Um, I don't know how they looked, but they probably looked pretty cool because these people are, like, worshiping them. And these angels are like, no, 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 no. I'm not God. But these people are terrified. Angels are just created beings. Angels aren't even God, and these people are wetting themselves when they see angels. In the book of Revelation, it talks about when Jesus shows up in his glorified body. And it says, John, the writer of Revelation, just literally falls on his face as if he was dead. 
all the fight is gone out of him. He's done, right? Like some people think, well, I'm going to tell God when I see him. No, you're not. <laughs> like you're on your face, completely exposed. All fight is out of you. You're done. You realize in that moment the difference between you and him. But as humans, we don't really feel it. We don't really feel that God is that big. And we don't really think about it that much. And honestly, it's kind of ridiculous how arrogant we can be. What, we've been alive a few years? And we think we've got it figured out. We're like, no, 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 I've got it. You know, and sometimes we even come up with our own way, our own religions. And we're like, no, I think I can figure it out. And this makes sense to me. Right? Because I've been alive for so long. And we're so arrogant when we come to God, not understanding how great He is. If God were just to stop allowing you to breathe, it would be over. Like, He has to allow us to breathe, and then we have that ability. Right? Like, if He didn't give us that grace, it would be over. And it's so funny when we take that gift that he's given us of the breath that he's given us and sometimes we mock him. Sometimes we argue with him, which arguing with him is okay. Like, respectfully. Um, But there's people that just ridicule him and say, God is this and I couldn't do this. I couldn't believe in this God. And without realizing that literally the breath in their lungs only comes from him. And we can just, we can get so, such a big view of ourselves and such a small view of God. One of the things that, one of the things that frustrates me is biology class. I hate biology class because it's really confusing class, right? Anyone that's in there? It's really confusing, but here's the thing. Half the stuff they're telling you is a lie. So many of the concepts in creation are so complex that for you to understand them, they just have to simplify them and then tell them to you. Because they're like, well, this is so complex that we'll just tell you the sun shines on the little leaf and then it gives it life. When really, like, the complex way that it grows is so much more intricate. And it's already too hard for me to imagine. And then to know that, like, especially in high school classes, so much, so much of it's just a lie, because like it's so much deeper than I can understand. I don't understand creation, and God has created that in a second to show His power. There is complex systems at work, and we think as humans we're so smart because we can like break it down and we know how it works. No, we don't. Like we can study it, but we're constantly changing our mind about it. God created all of that. He created all of it to show us how big he is. Think about the universe for a second and how far it expands. And all these stars, right? Like Betelgeuse, is is that what it's called? One of the the really big stars. And how we're so small compared to that. And yet that is just one of the stars that we know about. And this idea that You guys have heard that the universe is expanding, right? That's something that they've decided on now. They used to think it was eternal, now they know that it's expanding. If universe and space is expanding, what is it expanding into? Like, what is beyond space? Like, that hurts my mind to think about. (laughs) And all of that is in God's hand. And all the way down to the little ant that has, like, a system and, like, a colony It's just crazy to think about that. And I know so many times I can't think about all of that. And so what I do is I put God in a little box, which is funny because God created everything. He even created the box, and I can't put him in the box that he created, right? It's just dumb. (laughs) Don't try to do that, but I do because I'm simple, and I want simple things. And so I put God into my little box that I can control him. Uh, And I hear that God is loving so I think about the things that I know about loving, and then I just like, attribute them to God, rather than find out what is God's love. What He's the standard. So rather than going to Him, I just say God is like this, or God is like this, and I just make assumptions about Him and shrink it down. 
But the problem is, we can't do that. Because God is beyond that. We need to get to know him for who he is. So why does this matter? Why does this matter that maybe you don't have the biggest view of God? And you're, you might be thinking, well, if God's so big and everything that you just said, I can't really understand him, then why should I try? Why should I even try to understand God? And some people will not try. They'll just be lazy and they'll kind of give up and be like, whatever, I don't care. It's too much for me. But it is important. It's not just an intellectual thing, but it actually affects our lives. How we view God, how big God is or how small God is, really affects us. There was a point back there that I missed, didn't I? Um, it says, a God that we can understand is not worthy of our worship or our lives. And so that kind of goes well with this too. But a God that we can understand is not worthy of our worship or our lives. And that makes sense, right? Like, a God that we can understand, why would we ever give our lives to him? Okay, so we're going to go, um, the first point of why does this matter? I'm going to give you three points. Um, why it matters if we have a small view of God. And the first one is when we have a wrong view of God, it gives us an inflated view of ourselves and our problems. When we have a wrong view of God, it gives us an inflated yeah. view of ourselves and our problems. There's a story in the Bible about a man who comes to Jesus. And this man is known as a rich young ruler. And from the story, it's really easy to see that this guy does not have a, a big view of God. Because he comes to God and he says, he comes to Jesus. Um, spoiler alert, he is God. He comes to Jesus and he says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Um, and Jesus is like, well, first of all, why do you call me good? Because only God is good. But to answer your question, follow the commands. And already, this guy comes to Jesus and knows what he says. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He had a big view of himself. I can do this. I can get to heaven. I can earn this on my own. And so he's just, he wants to figure out what are the few things in his life that he needs to tweak. He's, he's already doing really well. He just wants to tweak a few things. And so Jesus tells him a few of the commandments. And he says, Jesus, I've done all of those since I was a kid. What else? What else do I need to do? Again, this guy has a pretty big view of himself to think that he has done everything perfectly. And Jesus says, one thing you lack, sell all of your possessions and come and follow me. And the story says, he goes away sad because he had a lot of possessions. You see, this guy had a small view of God. He came to Jesus, hoping to add Jesus to his life. He really wanted to have eternal life. I mean, like, yeah, he wanted it, you know? Like, that's a good thing. He wanted religion in his life. But then when Jesus says it's going to cost you something, this guy's like, yeah, okay, I didn't really want it that bad. And I think some of us can do the same. We can come to God, yeah, God, I, I want to be close with you. And then we find out what... What God, the way God calls us to live. And we're like, uh, you know what? Is God even that good? Is God even real? Like, I don't know. Like, I, he's kind of good. Heaven sounds good. But you know, this the sin I'm connected with is pretty good. And like, I kind of want to hold on to that. We have an inflated <clears throat> view of the things that we can see and a shrunken view of God. We don't see how good God is. We don't see how much he loves us. The plans that he has for us. And so we shrink him. So this guy that came to Jesus had a small view of God. A lot of people think the things we can see are better. But the best part 
of connecting with God is not the themes that God gives us, as in if these themes are better. There's another story in the Bible about a guy named Gideon. Uh, and Gideon is this guy that God chooses to lead the people against their enemies, the Israelite people. And Gideon is not a very courageous guy, but I don't really blame him um, because I don't really want to go into battle either. And God chooses him to lead his people um, to overcome their enemies. Uh, and I'm not sure if any of you guys have been in war before, but normally the way it works is whoever has a couple thousand more troops usually wins. Like, especially if they're running at each other old school style, you know, just, um, that's just the way it works. That's common sense, right? Army with more people usually wins. And that's the way Gideon thought too. And so as he's getting ready for war, he's got this huge army. He's ready to go out. He's still not very courageous here, but he's willing to do it. And then God starts talking to him. And God says, you have too many people. You need to get rid of some of your people. Uh, and he starts taking away people one by one. They're gone. And Gideon's like, e okay, now we don't have as many people, but we can still do this. And God's like, nope, still too many people. This is not good. Too many people. Let's get some more of them out of there. And you can just imagine Gideon like, what are you doing? Like, you asked me to do this thing, and now you're not doing it the way I wanted you to do it. Slowly, more and more people are gone. Until finally, it's not a very big group with Gideon. And God brings them to the enemy army and totally destroys the enemy army without these guys even fighting. And it, um, Gideon is just like in awe, right? But how frustrating would, would this be? Could you imagine? Like, as the story goes, it's like, cool, yeah, he should have trusted God the whole time, right? God had it taken care of. And yet, in our life, we don't trust God when we don't understand what's going on. But like I said before, we have these ideas of what God should do. The best plan for my life, maybe for someone else's life, and we know what God should do. And then God has this frustrating way of just doing something else. And we can't, we can't understand it. And so... Again, if God is just a slightly bigger version of me and just a sl slightly smarter version of me, then if he's not doing it, he's not powerful enough or he's just not as smart as me because clearly I know the way to do this. And if you guys don't think like this, man, you guys are awesome, but I know this is the way I think a lot. I fall into this of thinking, man, God, why aren't you doing this? This is the best way. And then he does something different and we get frustrated at it. And it's because we have a small view of God. If we understood that God's way is so much better than our way, his plan is far beyond the best plan that we could come up with, then we would trust him. And if God does something hard, we would say, God, bring it on. We know that you are good. And God's given us his word, which proves time and time again that he is faithful. But if we have a small view of God, we're not going to trust his plan. When, it, when God has hard things to say about relationships, about money, about the way we treat others, about forgiveness, no, 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 God, I have a better way than you. It's hard to trust him if we have a small view of God. We don't understand it. But I want you guys to think about this. Just like a little girl in the arms of her dad who is looking up at him in confusion because she's at a hospital and getting, and an evil man is sticking something in her arm and she's looking at her dad and she's saying, why would you let this pain happen to me? Because she doesn't understand what a shot is and that is for her ultimate good. Just like that disconnection. Can't we trust that we have a good dad? And that our understanding between the little girl and her dad is so much greater, our lack of understanding between us and God. And so when we see pain and we see things that we can't understand, rather than running away from God and saying, God, you can't be real. We need to humbly come to him and say, God, what are you doing? Show me what you're doing. And even if I don't understand until I'm in heaven with you, help me to trust in you. 
I heard this phrase once that if if God could do something, like if there's a situation where God could do something better, or if we could come up with a better plan than God, then he wouldn't be God. Like God's plan is absolutely perfect. And yet if I'm honest, I don't always think that. Like I, I kind of go along with God's plan because I trust him, but like I don't always think his plan is perfect. But if his plan is not perfect, then he is not God. And again, there's sin, right? But none of it's without, outside of God's control. God's plan is perfect. And so instead of thinking that we know better than God, we need to humble ourselves and be like, you know, God, you are, you are in control, and I'm going to follow you. And there's so much peace when we do that. When we follow a small God, man, it's rough. It's really lame. We should be freaked out and stressed and anxious all the time because our God is not very much stronger than us. But if we believe in a big God, then we can have peace. He is totally in control. He's got this. So finally, number three, when we have a small view of God, we don't appreciate the gospel as we should. We don't appreciate the gospel. And this is where it's also dangerous for us. The gospel is the truth that our sins have separated us from God. But the good news that Jesus paid the price by dying and raising again. That's the gospel. But if we have a small view of God, we think the gospel is small as well. And this is how it goes. Yeah, the gospel is good, and I'm really glad that, that Jesus died for me and stuff. And But... I mean, if he didn't die, I'm pretty good. I would probably have like an 80% chance of getting to heaven. Just on my, my goodness. Because I'm pretty awesome. We can shrink God and elevate ourselves. And elevate how good we think we are. We can shrink our sin, too. And be like, well, I'm not really that bad, right? Like, it was kind of dramatic the way he did it, right? Like, dying on a cross and everything. Like... Um, I don't know if he had to do all of that. He could have just like for, just forgotten it. And it would have been okay. So I appreciate you, God, and everything, but like, I didn't. I don't really need you because I'm not. I'm not really that bad of a person. Other people really need you, but for me, I'm not that bad. We can make our sin look small, but you know the only reason something looks big or small is how it's compared to something else, right? And so if you ever want to take a picture of a big spider that's on your wall or something, right? What do you do? Like put your hand next to it. You go, get a shoe. That spider is as big as a shoe. And you compare it to something in your picture, right? And you're like, okay, I want, to, I want to show everyone how big this is. And so compared to your shoe, the spider looks big. Because spiders are not supposed to be very big. But when we compare our sin to other people, well, I'm not that bad, right? That's how it can go. I'm not that bad because other people have messed up. We can all understand each other. So it's okay. I'm really not that bad. But when we compare ourselves to God's perfect standard, then we see how great our sin is. What an offense it has been. How we've rebelled against him with our lives. We, God opens up our eyes to see how incredibly needy we are of him. That it's not just like, oh, it was a nice thing, but without it, we would be forever separated from God. And when we have a view of God like that, man, there's so much joy that we can have because God has completely freed us from the, the debt that we deserved and he's given us a place in heaven. And we can have that confidence because it's not about ourselves. So finally, to finish up, I want to encourage you to keep growing in your understanding of God. To kind of like, maybe even do an exercise of like, just trying to stretch your mind to understand how big he is. When you pray, spend a little of time remembering how big he is and how, if you can pray to him and someone and people all over the world can pray to him and he can hear everyone at the same time, like, he's big. Don't doubt him. Don't live, don't believe in a God that's small because that's no God at all. 
either we're going to believe in the one true God who is completely powerful in charge of the whole universe who right now is on his throne and angels are in front of him saying holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty or we're going to believe in a small version of God that we created that's no God at all. 